In the last lecture, we looked at the internal factors and trends of education, gender and educational achievement. In this lecture, I'm going to be taking you through the external factors. So these are the factors which are outside of the education system that could influence girls and boys' achievement or underachievement in education, and we will then evaluate them. Now, as I said in the last lecture, on average, or the general trend is that girls outperform boys in education from the very beginning of their educational journey, with girls starting school with a much higher level of literacy, mathematics, um, language, and personal, social, and emotional development. And that trend and gap widens over the um, years and the journey in the education system with slight narrowing in terms of maths and science and technical subjects and further narrowing at A level. And the internal factors, the, the, the way the education system is set up does have an influence, but there are wider societal factors which could have led to this trend occurring. So when we're looking at the external factors, we're looking at things like feminism, changes in employment, change, gender role socialization, and gender, uh, sorry, changes in the family, and how all of these changes, and they're very much interlinked, so there will be a lot of repetition here, but they, the, these factors have risen the aspirations of girls to a point where they are able to um, aim higher for careers and educational um, success. But in, in, in the same regard, it has created what's called a crisis of masculinity in boys, which has de um, demotivated them or led to um, more underachievement. So let's get into it and look at these factors one at a time. So how has feminism led to girls' achievement in education and boys' underachievement? Well, the first thing we can talk about is more female role models. And we're not talking necessarily about those that are in SLT in schools or head teachers and things like that. We're talking about the wider societal role models and having it all. They have the family, they have the career, they have the loving um, partnerships. So it's the view that you, there are people out there who perhaps surface level, not necessarily entirely, but have it all. They have, they, they have success. They have familial success. They have career-based success. They have financial success. And girls can look up to these women um, and say, well, I want that too. So for example, to give you, um, Examples of, of successful women. Emma uh, Watson, who played Hermione in ha um, Harry Potter, she's a successful actress, activist, um, and um, UN ambassador. But she also holds a very high level degree in English literature from Brown University in America. Um, um, Miriam Balik, and I'm probably mispronouncing her name horrifically from Big Bang Theory. Again, a very successful actress, married with children. I think she might actually be divorced by now uh, at the moment, but um, she, has, she has a very lovely, loving family. She's a doctor of neuroscience, as well as having this wonderful career. So there's, 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 there's all in business. You've got um, Sandra Soddenberg, You've got Oprah Winfrey, you've got all these amazing women who hold quite high level um, positions within business, within their chosen field and high level um, educational um, attainment to get them to that position. But they also still come across as quite feminine um, and in more traditional familial roles as mothers and wives and um, partners and things like that. So that can kind of lead to more aspirations for girls, which is my second point, um, to do well in education so they can be successful in the same sort of way. And this was exemplified by a study by Sue Sharp. Um, it was a longitudinal study um, done in 1976, 1994, and then the early 2000s as well. But the, the early 2000s study hasn't, I don't think it's been published yet. I need to look into that one. 
But what Sue Sharp did was she interviewed a number of teenage girls, 13, 14, 15 year olds, and she gave them a list of um, achievements, lifestyle achievements, their education, career, husbands or partners, uh, family, all of these things. She asked them to rank them in order of importance to them. In 1976, the highest averaging um, aspirations were family, marriage, and home life. In 1994, it was education, career, and family. So we've seen a shift, even a, a quite dramatic shift in girls' aspirations. And those aspirations lead to girls achieve, try, trying harder in school, aiming higher in school, and achieving better results because they they're kind of like i really want to achieve something and i need to um um get the grades to do that um so feminism and that kind of idea of you can have it all has pushed girls to do better in education the second factor we need to look at is changes in employment so there have been a lot of changes in employment over um, the, the, the years. Um, but Mittos and Brown point out that um, there has been a growth in the service and um, care industries, which has created a more feminised career opportunity for women in healthcare, hospitality, teaching, clerical, childcare professions, etc. But what that has done is shown um, girls that there is more to being a housewife than mother, and there are lots of career opportunities out there to um, which create financial independence and career opportunity for women. And this can also lead to them becoming the breadwinner of the family. So they're seeing their mums, their um, sisters, their aunts, their grandparents becoming less de financially dependent upon their partners and more financially independent. So they're put, it, it, it's not just about seeing women in high positions, CEOs, CFOs and all of that, but seeing that there are career opportunities for women in what have traditionally been feminised career industries where they can excel and they don't have to be the wife and the mother. And this links into the equal pay and opportunities legislation that has um, been passed over the last 20, 25 years where um, you, you can't be discriminated against um in your um career because you're female or because you're male and again this has led to go giving girls a push to do well in education into in order to achieve career goals in high powered positions or just to see their own worth now it's been it's, it has been pointed out that quite often when it comes to salary negotiations women will not be as pushy as men and men might be achieving higher salaries because they're more likely to demand it but the equal opportunities um, and equal pay legislation and a lot of development recently with the um um he for she movement and things like that have opened up opportunities for women to pursue equal pay and pursue higher level careers and not be um, kind of left behind if you like um, or to there's also been changes in um, legislation in terms of job applications for example you are not allowed to ask a woman if she is planning to have or have any more children you would not they wouldn't ask a man that question it should not it's not allowed it's not a question that is allowed to be asked of women they're not allowed to be asked about their childcare um needs or childcare um issues when interviewing for for a job 
Um, if it's a question you wouldn't ask a male applicant, you don't ask it to a female applicant. It's as simple as that. Um, and also, in terms of changes in employment, there has been a decline in traditionally masculine professions, such as um, like steelworks and the coal mine. This is more towards uh, blue collar um, industries rather than white collar industries. But that has led to a crisis of masculinity. And we've talked about the crisis of masculinity previously. But what that means is that um, men or boys are kind of thinking, well, I don't need to try hard in school because there's no jobs out there for me anyway. So um, why even bother trying? And or I don't or not knowing what they're supposed to do in, in order to be the traditional male, the traditional breadwinner of the family when we're seeing that again that rise in the uh, more feminized industries where women are becoming the breadwinner so it's kind of all of these changes are giving girls more aspirations to do well but leading to the demotivation of boys through a crisis of masculinity our third factor is gender role socialization and this is obviously what's happening in the home initially as primary socialization and it can again be um, reinforced within the education system but the, the initial gender role socialization occurs within the home and what we see is that um, in terms of how boys are socialized they're socialized to be confident to be outgoing to be um, almost aggressive but not in a violent kind of way and Barbara in 1996 said, did a study where she had a group of students take a assessment, some sort of test, and then ask them how well they thought they'd done and give them some thinking about what they knew, how confident they were, they had to give themselves a score. And what she found was after she marked the test and compared to what the students thought they'd done, boys tend to overestimate their ability. They seem to think that they are better or able to do better than they actually can. And that can lead to um, that, that overconfidence can lead to boys not studying as much, not putting in as much effort into their studies because they think they can do it anyway. So I don't need to study because I'm, I'm good at it anyway. And that leads to underachievement because perhaps they're not quite as good as they think they are. Inversely, because girls underplay, uh, underestimate their ability, they work harder. I'm no good at this, so I'm going to have to do more study on it. I'm going to have to work harder on it, even if they're achieving relatively good grades anyway. Um, but it's that gender role socialization early on of being confident and aggressive and um, outgoing that leads boys to believe that they are more capable than they actually are, whereas girls are socialized into being more passive and quiet and reflective. And this links into um, in the individualization thesis in that there have been changes in gender role socialization um, where we're seeing more gender neutral parenting and getting uh, so Beck and Beck Gershenheim talk about the individualization as girls are adding being independent as part of their master status. I am an independent young woman which means I have to do it myself. I have to work hard. I have to achieve. I have to do well. And to do that, I've got to put the hours in. I've got to put the work in. And that's the, so the, rather than thinking about family first, they're thinking about themselves. Uh, what do I want and how am I going to get it? Rather than what do my family need? How can I support my family? So it's I versus first, we second. And that's giving, because girls are adding that independence to their master status, they are then pushing themselves to do better in education. But it all starts quite earlier than that in the, the idea of the bedroom culture and that girls start school at a higher level because they are engaging in more um, social and emotional development through role play in the home they're taking part in quiet activities so they're building that ideal pupil 
um, behaviour before they even reach school. They're, they're already socialised into acceptable behaviours that we would we would expect in a school before they get there. Whereas boys need to be socialised into that once they start school because they tend to be socialised into more outgoing, aggressive, robust, um, rigorous, not rigorous, um, riotous, if you like, behaviours um before they reach school where they've got to so they're told go out and play rough and tumble and all of that and then all of a sudden they're joining starting school and it's sit down be quiet and do what you're told girls have already been socialized into that which means that they are a, a step ahead of the boys going into the education going into the education system okay our final factor is changes in the family, and this kind of links back to changes in education, in, in employment and feminism, because what we're seeing is that even though there are changes in the family and we are seeing more lone parent families headed by men, predominantly lone parent families are headed by women. And that provides role models for girls in that they may see their mothers struggling financially or that they see them as um, working hard and achieving good things to provide for their family. And that can provide um, inspiration and provide aspiration for girls through look, seeing their hardworking mothers pushing themselves to do better for their children. And that links in with this idea that women are becoming the breadwinner of the family. And this is leading to a crisis of masculinity. So women are pushing themselves to do better they're pushing themselves in their careers but at the same time it's leading to a crisis of masculinity because what if women are doing the breadwinner role if they're if they're taking on the expressive role what does that mean men need to do because men aren't taking on the um instrumental the the express the instrumental now i've got the wrong way around women are taking on the instrumental role which leaves men to do the expressive role and that's not their role and women are still doing the expressive role anyway so what is the role of the man what what is it that they're supposed to do and that can be filtered down into children who are in school and it's like why, why bother i'm not going to achieve anything i'm not I, I don't know what my role is in society i don't know what my role is within the family so i'm just going to give up I'm, I'm, I, I just can't i'm i don't know what to do so this as women are becoming more aspirational men are facing a crisis as masculinity they don't know what it means to be a man and this isn't necessarily a overt conscious crisis it's more of an internal crisis so these four factors can lead to uh, can link into educational achievement and why girls are doing better than boys Girls have got more aspirational, boys have got less aspirational due to a crisis of masculinity. But again, this is not the reason. It's not what's happening outside of school that's causing this. Because, first of all, there's still the pay gap and the glass ceiling. Okay? In the UK today, for every pound a man earns, a woman earns 80p. There is a 20% pay gap. Now, as I said earlier, that could be because women are not necessarily pushing themselves to uh, in negotiations. They, they lack the confidence to do that. But there is still that glass ceiling where they may not say it overtly or, or openly, but women are still passed over for promotion because, oh, they might take maternity leave. Or they're gonna if they have children, they become unreliable workers. Um, and you've also got the issues of um, women not putting themselves out there. A recent study showed, and I can't remember who did this, but there was a recent study that showed that when given a job um, specification, men will look at it and say, okay, if I can do 30% of it, I'll go for the job. I can learn the rest on the job. If a woman can't do 80, if a woman can only do 80% of the of the specification they won't apply because that 20 percent will mean they're not good enough so the, the there is still those views that um and those traditional ideas in um 
workplace that could say that those that the the aspiration is not enough um you've also still got those traditional gender roles it's still expected although things are changing it's still expected that when a woman has a baby that she will go part-time that she becomes an unreliable worker that um they should give up their career or take a career break until the children are at school and they can go back to work now things are changing and those decisions about who's going to take a career break, who's going to go part time, if anyone is, they, they tend to be more economic decisions rather than traditional decisions. But there is still that view of traditional gender roles. And um, as much as girls might not be aspiring to be a wife and a mother predominantly, and that, as in Sue Sharp's study, we saw that they were more likely to want career and education before family and marriage. Um, there is still that expectation that women will want children and the older you get without having children the more people ask about when you're going to have children I'm nearly 40 yeah um, and I still get asked by my grandparents when I'm going to settle down and start having children they haven't quite accepted that I'm not going to have children I have decided I don't want children so that's not going to happen do what you lot all day I don't want to go home to one of you um, plus I have the cats. But there's still that societal expectation that it, if you don't want children as a woman, there must be something wrong with you. Or you'll change your mind when your biological clock is ticking. No, some people just don't want children. And that expectation is not placed upon men quite as much. Um, you've also um, got Diane Reed. Ready? Ray. Ray, something like that, um, who looked at class, gender and ambition. And what she found was the amount of aspiration and the amount of ambition that girls have is very much down to class. So it could be argued that class has a bigger influence on educational achievement rather than gender. In her study, what she found was that um, working class girls were less likely to aspire to high level careers because they see them as being out of their reach. And this could link into the um, focal concerns of the working class that was put forward by Sugarman, that working class tends to be more collective in their subcult in, in within their culture. So working class girls won't aspire to, to higher level careers necessarily because that might move them away from family and family is more important to them so this idea of girls aspiring to high level careers is quite a middle class one according to ray and girls yes working class girls do aspire to good education and having a career but it's not quite as high level of being a ceo or anything like that because there's the collective nature of the working class subculture and finally, it's argued that this idea of these external factors influencing educational achievement are, create, uh, are adding to the myth of meritocracy, that you just need to work hard and aspire to these high level um, careers. And you can get there when there are a lot of other factors such as class, ethnicity, um, uh, etc that will, will influence whether or not you're actually able to achieve these high level things you can aspire to do whatever you like doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get there because you may not have the opportunities you may not have the resources to do that so the these ideas of feminism changing um, employment changing family structures all of these things are adding to the myth of meritocracy if i just work hard enough I can do well and girls are buying into this myth um, more so than the boys which is leading to higher educational achievement. Okay so over the last two lectures we looked at both the internal and external factors which um, try to explain trends in gender and achievement. So the, what you guys need to be aware of is that you can be asked if you are asked about gender and achievement you need to talk about both boys under achievement and girls achievement you can't just focus on girls um educational achievement 
um, but also that this is very much a um, moving trend. Things change year on year, but we're not going to have data for the last two years. We might not even have data for next year. We don't know yet. But whether it's whether you think it's internal factors, whether you think it's external factors, that is up to you. You're going to need to decide which one you think has the most influence, and within there, which of those internal factors or which of those external factors has the most influence, and that's up to you to decide. I can't tell you the answer to that one.